Walter, the book is out. Congratulations. And I must say it's very handsome. Walter Perry in conversation with Scottish writers. And you have eight writers here. The first thing I thought of when I saw that list was, gosh, most of us here will have been to book festivals and we sat in the front row perhaps of Alistair Gray or perhaps it was Duncan Glenn or Tessa and thought it's lovely to get to know them through the personal aspect but did anybody record them actually speaking about their lives and you did and it's um, what gave you the idea? It was the sense <coughs> not just I had, but that uh, I think John Herman and I had in common, that uh, a whole generation of people were being sidelined in the sort of official uh, accounts of the day. And I remember Chris Grieve saying that, um, talking about the great heights of literature, uh, they don't exist without all the slope reading up to them. That's not to suggest that anyone here isn't, uh, isn't an important writer, but simply to say that a culture has to happen at all levels or it doesn't happen at all. So, for example, in the history of Scots, for, uh, when it lost its official status, partly through the loss of the court, partly through the loss of the parliament, when it lost its official status, it lost a whole kind of authority, which meant that part of that culture almost died with it. Yes. Well, it's interesting when you mention the loss of its status. It actually, it wasn't officially recognised in Scotland in Scottish education until very, very recently, was it 2015? And so a lot of these interviews were actually before that time. Yes, of course. When the, these people at the time then were actually ploughing a, a very difficult furrow. Well, except that, of course, there weren't... Very few of them were Scots speakers. Yes. Uh, but the recognition that in Scots as a language... Was an important um, element, yes, of course. You mentioned MacDermott. His name comes on many pages and sometimes um, not in the best light and other times, etc. And uh, there's a lot of very frank discussions here. <laughs> and a lot the of idea. Yes, and a lot of feelings come out. And the wonderful thing about a conversation is it's unrehearsed, as this one is. So far. <laughs> well, it is. And in a way, I'm hoping to find out a bit more about you. I, I better let you know, I know a fair bit already, and which made me it really, well, it obviously introduced me to your book, or I wouldn't have known about it. But I, as a folklorist, I thought, how fantastic to record those people while you still can. That's what folklore is. There's an element of luck as well, of course, a big element of luck. I was very lucky to be able to... I was lucky in knowing the people in the first place, uh, but I was lucky in that uh, I recorded some of them late in the day. So, particularly, for example, Duncan Glenn, Donald Campbell, both of whom I'd known for 40 odd years, um, and it had just never occurred to me to record them. Also, of course, at the time when I started doing this, the kind of telephone, mobile telephone technology we have now, which makes it easy, wasn't really available. No. So the recordings with Duncan and with Donald uh, were done with a, a little hand recorder, uh, which was actually done on tape, tiny, tiny tapes, and then had to be transcribed. And the quality was sometimes atrocious. I can, I can remember it. it taking several weeks just to transcribe Donald's interview. Yes, um, the, the average apparently to, to transcribe one hour of tape is nine hours. Really? That's for I a didn't good, know that. Yes, for a good transcriber. But you can't sit at it the whole time. No, indeed. Um, because it's very demanding and winding it back and so on. That's for a, a, an experienced transcriber of a good recording. And if you have poorer quality, of course so on. But My advantage, Margaret, though, was that uh, when I'd done the transcription, I would send it to Donald and to Duncan, and they would um, correct or change it accordingly. So it really was a collaboration. Yes, well, that's a great... Um, and I wanted to encourage them to say, 
what mattered to them, not what mattered to me or what mattered to some kind of abstract public. These weren't public events in the sense they were private conversations, albeit knowing they would be published. Yes. This summer, looking at the programme, which was a lot online, of the Edinburgh Book Festival, which I always loved and I imagine they did, I, I could suddenly, I had a great feeling of nostalgia for that buzz of the Edinburgh scene. Uh, much of this has been really, has contributed to that scene. Um, I think of Duncan Glenn, whom you just mentioned, I, I hadn't really come across him till about 1985 or so, when he was putting on a piece for, um, it was at one of the festivals in Edinburgh, and I was astounded at the range that he covered and the people that in, with whom he connected and encouraged. Yes. He woke me up. Yes. Yeah. He, he, um, he was an important figure as a, an enabler of others. Yes. That, I think, was probably Duncan's single biggest contribution. He thought of himself, <coughs> as most of us do, I suppose, who get involved in literature in this way, he really wanted to be a poet. That was his primary ambition. And it was the poetry, of course, that had taken him to McDermott and had taken him into literature in the first place. But it wasn't, it wasn't his greatest gift. His greatest gift was to be an enabler of other people. He certainly succeeded in he, that. He did, indeed. Yes, he did. And and he published some very nice books himself. He yes. certainly did. Yes, he did. Um, and I'm interested that he was somebody who grew up absolutely in a sort of ancient Scots-speaking family, and yet he moved south to England and then coming back to Scotland. Um, he never lost the connection with Scotland, no, of course. No. But he, he moved south because that's where the work was in his particular line. It was, he was a print designer by profession. Do you think that a moving away like that, or a arriving in Scotland, um, is, has a big advantage in as much as that it, it sharpens the vision, it sharpens the focus on things you maybe take for granted when you live here, and you go away and you, you realise they're I'm no sure that's there. true. I think other languages do that for you. Mm -hmm. But I also think unless you can somehow stand outside the ordinary. It's not just that you will lack perspective. The way in which you use language will become pedestrian. You need, you need something which pushes you into seeing the world slightly differently. So the, the great poets of the 20th century in English are Dylan Thomas, who is Welsh, McDermott, who is Scots, Yeats, who is Irish, Seamus Heaney, if you like, who is from the Six Counties. Um, perhaps the only two great English-English poets of the later part of the century are Auden and Ted Hughes. Tell us about your, your publication of <coughs> each one as an individual piece. Well, they all appeared as individual frass pamphlets, which is the magazine set up by John Hurt and myself in 2004. I think we did the first interview in 2005, um, and that was with Donald. Yeah. Uh, and Donald and John, why Donald? Because uh, Donald and John had been pals from about 1970, and they had both been leading figures in the heretics. Uh, I first met Donald about the same time, uh, I had published a little pamphlet of his in 1974, um, which was before he started writing plays. Uh, when I first met him, he was still working uh, on a building site doing, I think, doing accounts. Uh, but he knew he was a writer. That was, that yeah. was his yeah, ambition. Uh, and John, of course, was already establishing himself as a writer. So Donald, see, Donald was someone we knew and approachable. Uh, yes. So we went and interviewed Donald. I believe my first own first encounter was at one of his own plays yes. in the Edinburgh Festival. And I thought he was an absolutely terrific playwright. And then, of course, it was his radio piece, The, the Miller's Reel, and my son played a video ah. on that, yes. Um, so to be introduced by a schoolboy to this was quite 
interesting and sure. he, he was he thought oh wait till you hear this and, and it was the way it all moved and Donald came to feel latterly that he'd been hard done by by the Scottish theatrical establishment mm -hmm. and I think there's considerable truth in that um, he did, there are many ways in which Donald wasn't quite prepared to fit in that's he, the kind he, of character he was yeah. he, he comes he, very much an Edinburgh man, but also very much a Caithness man. Absolutely, yes. yes. And um, letting him tell his own story, which I certainly didn't know till I read and your interview. His, and with his Gaelic versions oh, yes. of Rob Down. Yes, and I hadn't realised, it, it, well, he was unlike most of the others. He didn't have a, a, a either a privileged education or a university education. He felt a bit of a failure when he left school and... Um, Went off to London. That's it. And I was very taken by his candid expression of how he felt. He said, for a long time I felt I'd failed at school and then I suddenly realised, no, school had failed me. <laughs> yeah, that's well put, and, isn't it? And it is well put. Yes. It is well put. And the other one mentioning school, who had, she did have a privileged education, was Tessa, Tessa Ransford. And I, it almost stung me to read what she said, looking back on her boarding school education. By the time I got there, it was still Victorian. And where are we talking about? Well, maybe I shouldn't mention where it was. Well, I think you should. Of course well, you should. Well, there you go. We were physically, emotionally and intellectually deprived. And, and I wonder, I mean, she obviously felt this very deeply. That's, of course, the point of view of a person who, in relation to, say, growing up as a working class Scot in the 1920s or 30s, was already coming from a privileged position. She was. She Nevertheless, was. I, I know exactly what she meant. And it reminds me of a conversation, or different conversations I've had over the years, with both Trevor Royal and John Herdman, where their, the level to which they were familiarised during their education with Scottish history, with Scottish literature, uh, with the general Scottish situation, they left school or university knowing next to nothing. Mm. Uh, and it was only as adults that they came to understand yes. something of our cultural background, our cultural history. Yes, yes. And, to, and in all these cases, perhaps partly because of that, to play a large part in it. Yes. As they all have them. Um, picking up on, on your mention of, of, of Trevor Royal, that name, of course, would be well known to people well out to literary circles. He appears as a, a very prominent and memorable writer in newspaper ar articles, and often about the war. One of the things I loved, uh, and, and I could relate so well to this, when he was writing his book about the Raj, and he began with his own mother, which I think is a splendid place to begin. And she was a splendid person, by the way. Yeah. Well, I it was my privilege um, also to know yes, her. Yes, and I, I just loved this. Suddenly I realised that a lot of people who had lived through the period of the end of the empire in India, who were in their 70s and 80s, and that unless you record their memories, it would have disappeared. And so I began with my own mother, and then got handed on and eventually found himself and he talks about his the enormous amount of research aided by somebody who helped him with the interviews. What a great approach. Yes, absolutely. And I was yeah. really, um, that recognition. Um, it's the emotional connection which makes a difference. Yes. It's no yes. longer abstract. It's, you're not functioning as some kind of a abstract historian. You're functioning because, yes. because it matters to you. These are your people. Yes, and, and being a folklorist and oral historian, you can realise why I would certainly relate to that in a huge way. Um, as I, I, I always have that concern. We must record more in case it's lost. Um, and and it, there's also this continuing uh, Scottish, but particularly Gaelic theme of knowing, or and Irish, of knowing who your people were. This obsession yes. with our own history. Yes. <coughs> and a, and a, right, a rightful obsession, I would well, say. I think it has so much. It really does. And yes, you do get to know even writers that you thought you knew. 
Yes. I'd met Alistair Gray many times, but my word, don't you? I thought, well, Walter's bit is going to tell me the bits that I, and of course you do, you you you, you bring in things. That, he was he, he was a child prodigy, really, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was. And he stayed he stayed like that all his life. That was his charm, or part of his charm. Yes. He was still a child prodigy at 80. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I, I do remember when Lanark came out, this tome. took me forever to read it, by the way. And I was thinking, wow, I never met him. Wow, how did this come out of somebody's head? It was just... But reading him in conversation, writing and conversations are different. Very much because so. Because you can spend hours and hours on one paragraph and then you get it the way you want it. But in conversation, out it comes. And he tells not one, but I don't know, dozens of complete plots of either things he'd invented or things he read. And he doesn't miss out a single motif. His memory was extraordinary. Quite uh, extraordinary, yes. yes. I could see the detail that he comes up with in that kind of conversation it seems to be reflected in his drawings. Yes, I think Alistair would have agreed with that, actually. Would he? Yeah, I think yes. so. Mm -hmm. They I were very important to him. Oh, gosh me, I could see every little detail. Every, it was, I, I was almost breathless reading those pieces. He didn't talk a whole lot about his actual upbringing, except his father, whom he acknowledged as being very intelligent, and his father told him he was more intelligent. They couldn't agree on who was the most intelligent, <laughs> which is an unusual children's exchange. In Scotland, absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing about the interview, not just with Alistair, but with <coughs> with most of the people in it, they were nearly all, with, with two exceptions, I think, they were all done with John Herman. Yes. And it's... In the case of in the case of Alistair, Alistair is a novelist, and uh, John's a sort story writer. Yeah, yeah. There's a I wouldn't have known really where to begin. It was the it was the interplay uh, of the the three perspectives which makes it an interesting interview. Yes. Because John and I, although we've collaborated over the last twenty years and have known each other for half a century, John's perspective in the world is very different from mine. Yes. Uh, and, uh, fortunately for him. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a difference that causes friction and it can cause animated debate and, and agree to disagree or a, a rejoicing in... I think in the kind of collaboration direction. we achieved wouldn't have worked between two poets or between two prose writers. I think one of the ways it worked is because precisely because we are different. Yes. In Although we... We share lots of views, of course. Yes, and political and social, etc. And but coming from very different backgrounds. Totally yes. different backgrounds. Um, one of the things I think that, apart from his great skill as a novelist and and continued skill as a as a short story writer, one of the things that struck me about and strikes me still about John Herdman was that he was in the, sort of he was in the the front line of trying to bring cultural events to stages where they might never happen or yes. bring people together with the heretics and um, I don't know if, and who the group were and why they got together and they were in some ways a very unlikely set of people. In some ways we are what we share mostly is what now by many people would be regarded as rather an old-fashioned view <laughs> which is that of the absolute importance of the written word when taken seriously by uh, by an artist. So, mm -hmm. in John's case, it's backed up by what I see as a deeply religious attitude to life. Uh, and that runs as a thread, not just through his work, but through his life. Um, in some ways, I'm a more secular character, I think. Uh, but without some kind of notion of the sacred underlying what one does and underlying the value you give it, then you're not going to be motivated across a lifetime to do it. Yes, um, Tessa springs to mind. Yes, Tessa but, had that, shared that kind of yes, view, yes. In, and she describes how she set up and why she set up the poetry library. Um, and now people accept the poetry library as 
part of the Edinburgh Fait accompli. Yes, and it's there. It's got a wonderful website, a wonderful library. She talks about Tom Hubbard's role as a librarian, how he was absolutely crucial to how it was set out and, and the recognition of writers. Um, and as I say, it's sort of taken for granted in a way, but without Tessa, we wouldn't maybe have it. I'm sure we wouldn't. Absolutely certain we wouldn't have it. But of course, the whole nature of cultural achievement is to get to the stage where it is taken for granted. Yes. There was one thing that she said, and I, I put the book down and thought, wow, how true is this? And it's a very simple thing. And it is. It, it, she's, she's reflecting on other people's view of writers. What do they want, you know, sure. uh, etc. And she said, it's not money that writers want. It's readers. Absolutely, yeah. And I thought, wow, how true is that? How true that is? And I think all of us, all of us, I'm sure, have given away more copies of the book just to somebody who, who was so, etc. Um, and maybe very often people who receive a book in that generosity of spirit don't actually realise that it's not a free book at all. The writer is paying for it. On the other hand, the reader is repaying the writer. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I... There's a because because a lot of of especially poetry is done through small publishing companies who don't have huge grants, and the whole economics of right of publishing and writing sure. is quite a challenging one. It's become much more so in the last half century. It has it has yes in Scotland at least been completely transfigured. There's an element to which now, of course, with um, one of the benefits of cheaper publishing is that, um, in some ways, it's easier. That has its disadvantages also, of yes, course. Yes, yes. Um, we are overwhelmed, wonderful. as it were, by people who uh, have no discipline whatsoever. So, something you wouldn't get away with in music, so the, the level of incompetence, which simply would be unacceptable in music, uh, is often that level of self-indulgence uh, very often passes itself off as poetry. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with you about the incompetence in music. I'm, I'm, it's um, you know, music man well, maybe a writer. Of course, writing too is there's a matter of taste is also involved as well as what I call integrity. But if you can't play and the piano, you can't play the piano. Well, that's very true, but you'd be surprised how one doesn't need to even play it badly to make a <laughs> CD anymore. You can, you can make a CD on your laptop and, no, I suppose, and plug yes. it in the local whatever. But um, I think of, a, of poets that I mentioned, Willie Hershaw, whose poetry is, oh my word, his collection of poems based in his own Fife mining background, the Sayer Road, with that analogy between the plight of the miners and Christ on the cross, it's just oh, wow. And Very traditional analogy. By oh the way. yes, and and you realise that you know the conventions of religion doesn't matter what religion Christian religions would probably think oh, now just hang on a minute. There's no but however, as it's expressed in his poetry and read in his own, you can hear his voice. Um, there's something very powerful. It doesn't matter whether you're, a pract you're practicing any particular religion in Scotland or not, by which I mean the kind of ancient religions of Scotland, you know, whether you're in Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Catholic or whatever. Uh, we are all inheritors in that sense, or nearly all of us, are inheritors of the Christian tradition at a cultural level, and at that level we cannot but be Christians, and if we abandon that entire background of metaphor, of imagery, and of tone, the kind of voice that you will find, for example, in uh, the King James Version, uh, then you surrender the largest part of your cultural heritage. I think as a, some American writers I know have great difficulty with anything which traditionally in Scotland or in English poetry uh, would be regarded as high voice, that kind of 
elevated voice used for what were regarded as super serious subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, the Americans don't have such a voice, nor do they understand it in modern English. Except nowadays they, there's a tendency in academia to elevate the language into a sort of speech that is so in, unintelligible to the people about whom they write, so that it distances the academic writer from their subject, because it's a... Um, Nowhere that, more so than in French critical theory, for critical. example, mm -hmm. uh, much of which, of course, will turn out in the passage of time to be nonsense. Yes, I, 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 I do relate to the, that. It may seem ordinariness of speech, but being able to relate to it, if you can't, there's no point as far precisely as I'm concerned. So, precisely so. And there's some wonderful expressions in There's some lovely discussions in here about the orthography of Scots and the, um, um, I don't know that the word Philistine is used, and the, <laughs> but, but there's one or two people named and not shamed. No, no, they can hold their own. But the, there's lots of room for opinion here. Of course. It's eight different, it's ten different people. Yes, yes, and um, again, McDermott comes to the fore as nobody, oh no, he, oh, maybe McCaig would be in there as well, none more controversial. Yes, they two, I would say, the two of them get the prize for that. And neither one comes out as being, reg admired, yes, but with affection, often not. Difficult, I think. Um, Grieve was a deliberate ideological controversialist. Yes. McCaig was personally acerbic. And you, that's. Mm. His writings are not acerbic. No, no. But Chrissy's were. McDermott's were. Yes. Therein yes. lies the difference oh, yes. between the two characters. Yes, I, I did. So McCaig offended a lot of people, mm -hmm. personally. Yes. A I, lot of I, people I, simply mm -hmm. didn't like him. Grieve offended huge numbers of people, politically, socially, and historically, yes. but deliberately. Do you know, I think Hamish Henderson recognised this, although they had the flighting in the news. Yes, of course. And, and yet Hamish was filled with admiration for him. Oh, absolutely. Which Who I felt, that, that's the strength of it, because it's not a personal dislike, it's a, a fundamental disagreement on, sure, on, on the value matters. of yes, on the value of traditionally handed down ballads. They ha they are worthwhile. Yes. That is our, that's who we are. These are our ballads. Which McDermott <coughs> well. But he was he was pursuing a particular line mm -hmm. which was principally directed against what he he saw as being uh, a debasement of traditional Scottish culture. So he was he was the hyper-intellectual. And some of that may be the result of his not having been university educated, which McCaig was. McCaig had a first in classics. Mm. Grieve was always deferential to academics who, as often as not, may or may, some were certainly fraudulent, um, others not. But uh, Grieve was so intellectually uh, above them, uh, and yet he deferred to them because they were called professors. Ah, uh, you see, I hadn't sensed that he deferred to them. Yes, he very often yes. did in many ways. At the end of the day, not, of course. He yes. was his own man and did mm -hmm. what he was going to do. But he, yes, there was that element of deference, and I think it came from the marginal insecurity of not having had that, mm -hmm. any academic background. Yes, well, he's the only one of whom I haven't met, or didn't meet, but obviously um, I've more than come across his writing and, and he's stopped me in my tracks many times. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Yes. <laughs> I loved, I, and I, in fact, I, I, I have it on a little card on my wall, the rose of all the world is not for me. Again, an entirely controversial oh, piece of writing. Well, yes. it was made controversial mm. by, I think, I think it was Morris Lindsay who kicked Morris. up such a fuss about <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, ah, uh, but it's got something. Yes, yes. yes of course oh, it does. Oh, it really does. He's got Sam something. Sam McLean said of McDermott, some of McDermott's early poems, that uh, mm. they were actually pathological in their intensity. That they yeah. they were otherworldly in that sense. There was, they were yeah. touched by something. Yes, uh, you could say that about several of these. Uh, you could say that about <laughs> about Alistair Gray. They oh, were yes, definitely absolutely. touched by something, and it wasn't just eccentricity. It, no, he was no, in another. No, no. Um, it's a remarkable mind, and in fact, this represents a such a a, a gathering. Oh yes, and sadly, four of them are no longer with us. Indeed. We can thank you uh, forever, really, for capturing the voices. Trevor Royal said to me uh, in conversation not long ago that he thought it was a, an interesting book because it captured elements of a period which would not otherwise have been captured. Absolutely. And in our case, in the case of those who were my friends, it captured an element of our lives which would not otherwise have been captured. Yes. You begin to see the social, oh, it's what, like one of those big, what do they call them, Venn diagrams or circles of people, and, and you're about a handshake away from each one at any stage, and yes. it's quite exciting. Yes. Um, I had read all of them before they were put into the collection, so that's over years. And then when the book arrived, I thought, well, this is a very handsome book and it's got a lovely feel to it, it's beautifully, it's got lots of breathing space, like a conversation. This, it's, it, it breathes and I can hear their voices even although I didn't hear the recordings I can hear their voices which is a great thing because you've, you've projected that and the immediacy of the conversation and something I very seldom say about a book I could hardly put it down 